Uh, I'm Laura Tyson, and I had the honor of uh, following Michael Boskin in the Council of Economic Advisors, so I learned a lot uh, from him. Um, I think the idea is we're just going to make some preliminary remarks so we can engage in discussion, and I like to frame my remarks around a theme I've been using in the past six months or so, and that's that the U.S., uh, we can conceive of the policy challenges confronting the U.S. in terms of three different kinds of deficits. Uh, first of all, the jobs deficit, uh, second of all, which we all know about, second of all, what I would call the investment deficit, but here I'm talking about the investment in public foundations of competitiveness, education, infrastructure, and innovation. And then the last deficit, of course, is the very well-known fiscal deficit about which I will probably say the, the, the least. So let me just give you my sense briefly of what these three deficits are. Um, first of all, the jobs deficit. Well, we had some pretty good jobs numbers this morning. We've had good job numbers for the last uh, three months or so. We've had actually a private sector job growth month after month after month uh, for a considerable period of time. But it is important, it seems to me, to just keep in mind, well, let's see. We may or may not get advancement of slides here. Um, I can tell you about the job deficit without the numbers. Uh, yeah, the first thing to note is that if you look at the, my first chart, which you can't see right now, uh, you will see, not a surprise, that the job loss during the 2008-2009 recession was extremely deep. The decline in employment was twice as large as the previous post-war recession. So that's very important. And even today, uh, with a good jobs report, if the number of unemployed is 8.3 and you think your structural long-term unemployment rate that's based on uh, supply-side considerations, not demand-side, is around 5 to 6, we're still at elevated unemployment rate. Elevated unemployment rate, elevated long-term unemployment rate, elevated number of persons who are working part-time when they wish to work full-time. The Hamilton Project does a regular estimate of what they call the jobs gap. It's the number of jobs the U.S. would have to create to get us back to the peak levels. Oh, here we go. The peak, or, or down there, I can see the picture. The peak level of uh, employment reached, before, <laughs> reached at the end of, uh, uh, excuse me, the jobs gap, so you know, is the peak, the number of jobs need to be created to get back to the peak employment level before the onslaught of the 2008-2009 recession and, in addition, enough to absorb the increments to the labor force that would normally occur. That number currently stands around 11.5 million jobs. 11.5 million jobs. Well, I'll get to that chart in a minute. <laughs> okay, that, that is not what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> okay, so uh, just keep that number in mind. That's, that's an estimate of the number of jobs that we have to create. And at the current pace of job creation, we wouldn't fill that gap until sometime after 2020. If the job creation rate picks up to 300,000 a month, we'll get there by January 2017. But this just to just indicate we have a long way to go. It was a very deep recession. We have a lot of unemployment to still get through. But I also want to say that there were a lot of signs of structural stress in the labor market before the recession and before, therefore, the significant increase in unemployment simply due to a lack of aggregate demand. The source, let me just give you a list of the sources of stress. We can talk about any of these, not the, the indicators of stress. Job growth in, two, in the decade of the 2000s prior to 2007-2008 was half the rate of the previous two decades. There had been going on before the recession a secular decline in the labor force participation rate. There had been going on before the recession a decline in the employment population ratio. These were not due solely to aging. There was an aging effect, but there was something else going on. A very sharp decline in the employment rate for men, especially low-skill men with less than a college degree. Today, 66% of working age men have full-time jobs. In 1970, that was 
Then there are a series of indicators, and now I can go to the next slide, uh, that really look at the quality of jobs. So we talk about the jobs deficit, we usually sort of talk about numbers of jobs, but it's also important to talk about the quality of jobs. And this, this chart just shows, and it's now been extended through 2010, I just got the chart this morning, something really very disturbing to my mind, which is there's a decline uh, that's a persistent decline in median real annual earnings for uh, male workers. Uh, one of those lines, the one that looks worse uh, with a very sharp decline at the end, is for all men aged 25 to 64. That includes men who are in prison, men who are uh, not working, men who are working. So this is the working age population. This is what's happening to it. And if you're a full-time employed male worker, your median real annual earnings really isn't going anyplace fast for a very long time. That's, to my mind, a very good chart about the quality jobs deficit. Another way, another chart I could have put up here is we've had strong productivity growth. We always hear about strong productivity growth. It's great. It's wonderful. Between 2002 and 2007, that the period of the, of the recovery under President George W. Bush, Worker productivity grew strongly. Hourly compensation for median workers, whether they had a high school education or a college education, actually did not. In fact, the median compensation of college and high school educated workers was declining, not rising, as productivity rose. So, and I'll give you one other indicator of stress in the labor market, and that's polarization. Very good work has gone on to look at uh, the polarization, which is that jobs and employment opportunities, when the economy is doing well, grow strongly at the top. They grow pretty well at the very bottom. They have not been growing in the middle. And that is the polarization phenomena. So there are other things that I could mention uh, about uh, the stress in the labor market, but let me go on to talk about the investment deficit a little bit. The investment deficit, look, other advanced industrial countries are going through some of the same problems of the United States, even Germany, meaning you can see polarization evidence in Germany. You can see it in the large developed economies around the world. You can see uh, a problem of, uh, of rising wage inequality in these other countries. You can see the evidence of what you might call common structural forces working on the U.S. and on the other developed economies. Skill bias technological change, taking out certain kinds of jobs and replacing them with automation and increasing the demand for other kinds of jobs with very high-end jobs, so that's skill bias technological progress. And then, of course, globalization. And economists debate the role of globalization versus skill bias technological change, but the truth is uh, they probably are very hard to disentangle. The supply chain that we think about in the world that might be a source of imports that might be taking out middle-income jobs in the United States, that supply chain is made possible by technology. So you really can't make the distinction between trade and technology. So other countries are going through the same thing. Uh, and one of the other ways it shows up is the share of labor income and national income. This has been a statistic that's been brought up quite frequently recently in the press. The share of labor income and non-farm business income is at an historic low in the United States. Historic low since the numbers have been collected. The share of labor income and national income, comparable numbers in other developed economies, show the same pressure. But the U.S. is the more extreme number. So we have more polarization. We have more wage inequality. We have a lower share of labor income and national income. We're subject to the same forces of skill bias, technological change, and globalization. What else might be going on to explain the differences in the U.S., the greater stress in the labor market in the U.S.? And I would say here's where you could say, declining competitiveness of the U.S. as a place to do high-value-added production and high-value-added jobs. We do high-value-added innovation. We're sitting in the middle of the, the center of the world on high-value-added innovation. The question is, where does the production occur? 
and where does the jobs for that production occur. Uh, there's a, some evidence. I worked on a study for McKinsey a couple years ago, McKinsey Global Institute, 2010. We looked at the U.S. on a whole variety of indicators of competitiveness as a place to do business, particularly high-end manufacturing, production, services, and employment. And what you saw, what we found, is either the U.S. was holding its own or on many, many indicators was declining, was declining relatively. The whole issue of Harvard Business Review out in March, this March, has a survey, has many, many studies which make the same point. So if that's the case, that there's been a relative decline in the competitiveness of the U.S. as a place to do business, why? The Harvard Business Review study, the McKinsey study, the President's Jobs Council, the President's Council on Jobs and Competitiveness, it's its formal name, and Jeff Immelt, you'll be hearing from him tonight, shares that, uh, identified several areas of public investment where the U.S. is not doing enough to make itself uh, to shore up or strengthen its competitiveness. So what are these areas? National spending on research and development, uh, availability of high-quality labor, whether you can look at that from a K-12 through education issue, you can look at that as a community college skill technical training issue, you can look at it as an engineering PhD issue, look at it across the board. We are not doing enough, investing enough, creating enough uh, uh, workers with the right level of skills. Uh, another area, of course, is the quality of our telecommunications and transportation infrastructure. By the way, a couple of areas that the business community might hear about this uh, in the next session pointed out besides these areas of investment were corporate tax rates and regulatory structure. So basically you have a whole list of possible areas for the government to take action on at the federal level to improve the competitiveness of the U.S. economy. Um, I will just say that in these three spending areas, research and development, education, particularly technical education, STEM education, I would say community college all the way through the uh, end of PhD education, uh, those areas and infrastructure are areas which if you actually look at discretionary spending in the United States on, by the federal government, those things amount to less than 10% of the budget. Okay, so we're, we're not spending, uh, the next chart I have here, everybody should just uh, I put this up here just to show that point. If you look at scientific and research, if you look at transportation infrastructure, you look at education, basically you're getting less than 10% of the gov federal government spending in these major investment areas. So I think that is a mistake. And one of the things that the president has done in his own budget proposal that has just come out is to say, okay, I propose a $4 trillion cut in the deficit in 10 years. I propose, however, that we increase spending on infrastructure, education, research, manufacturing, and we can talk about that. So let me end just with the fiscal deficit because I've already taken more time than I think we agreed upon uh, in my opening comments. Um, I'm, I'm just going to leave you with one thought, or two, maybe two. One is, I think the uh, def fiscal deficit problem is a long-term problem. It's not an immediate problem. It's not even a medium-term problem. Uh, the baseline projections of the Congressional Budget Office, not the OMB, so if you don't want to listen to the administration, go to the Congressional Budget Office. The, the baseline projections of the CBO on the deficit over the next decade show the deficit as a share of GDP coming down. That is even if, even if uh, the tax, all of the tax cuts that are set to expire do not expire. If all the tax cuts that are set to expire expire, the deficit as a share of GDP over the next decade goes down to below, to the area of 2%. Plenty low to stabilize the debt to GDP ratio. To stabilize the debt to GDP ratio, you need a deficit to GDP ratio of about 3 so that, my first point is we don't have an immediate crisis and we don't have a medium-term crisis. We certainly do have a long-term crisis. This is well known, and my charts here, my final charts, really show that the problem is pretty much on the spending side in one area. <laughs> it is in health care. So when I hear people talk about the deficit long-term challenge, I say, let's talk about it actually more simply as the healthcare challenge and the 
revenue challenge. Those are the two issues. How much do we want to uh, deal with bringing revenues up and how, much, how can we control uh, health care costs? And let me just end on the health care cost side with there was a letter that a number of economists uh, and health care experts wrote in the process of the health care debate about deficit reduction. And they said that the largest contribution to deficit reduction is going to have to be from slowing health care costs. And they also said that the health care reform law that has been passed includes nearly all of the steps we currently know how to do to slow health care costs over the next five to ten years. All the things we know how to do. Um, because basically the situation is we need to slow the cost both in the entire health care system and in the Medicare system, but you can't do one without the other, and there are a whole variety of challenges uh, to doing just that. Uh, my final point here will be on the revenue side. If you think about the long-run deficit problem as a health care spending problem and a revenue problem, then on the revenue side, I would conclude a credible long-term deficit reduction plan requires revenue increases. Revenue increases have been an important part of successful deficit reduction packages enacted over the last 30 years. Every single one of those packages has had a revenue component. And finally, U.S. total tax revenues, federal, state, and local as a share of GDP, put the U.S. at the bottom of the OECD countries. So there's a little room between the current 15% of GDP being collected in federal taxes and the 22% uh, or the 20% that was collected under, for example, President Reagan. So President Reagan was collecting 22% of GDP in terms of taxes, federal taxes. We're currently at around 15. Um, that gives you some sense of where we might be able to go. Thank you very much. Good morning. Let me first uh, congratulate John once again and the CEPR staff for this great event. One of the great joys of one's life as you uh, get more experienced and move on is to see something you helped found move to much bigger and better things than you imagined. So congratulations on that, John. And I also want to welcome Laura. It's a delight to have her back at Stanford. Uh, we've worked together on, on some things. I, uh, as John mentioned, I initiated NAFTA in a conversation with President Salinas' chief of staff, and, President, and we, we got it in very good shape, but not over the finish line. And President Clinton, with Laura to side, ran a very brave anchor leg, and it's been a tremendous success. So uh, that and many other things, I helped President Clinton on Social Security reform, which one of the tragedies of his uh, personal scandal was that he never got to do that. And it's probably the best time in a strong economy for a moderate Democrat to do that, but it didn't, didn't work out. In any event, delighted to have you here. You won't be surprised that there is much that Laura said that I agree with, nor will you be surprised that there are some things I'm in pretty strong disagreement with. Some of those are analytical points, and some of those are interpretive points and uh, interpretations of the evidence and interpretations of the effects of, for example, of much higher taxes on the economy. So let me start by, uh, I was going to say a few words about the global conditions in the short run and about the U.S. Uh, fiscal situation relative to other countries, and I'm going to focus on generic fiscal issues and then come back to the U.S. So let's start with the fact, as John told us this morning, that the current, uh, the current picture, even though the U.S. is improving, it's in a very weak recovery by historical standards. It's at about one-third pace in GDP from a strong, from the typical strong recovery from a deep recession, and about a one-fifth pace in employment. Let's hope that the uh, recent improvements continue, but it still should be growing at five, six, seven percent for quarter after quarter out of a deep recession, and we've been struggling in the twos. Uh, this quarter is probably uh, going to be even uh, a little lower than last quarter. That's number one. Number two. Even the, uh, most of Europe is in trouble. Many of those countries are in negative territory and uh, struggling and perhaps getting worse. 
And even the developed, uh, the, pardon me, the developing countries that have been doing so well, China, India, and Brazil have all been slowing. There is no such thing as decoupling of these countries. They have more internal demand and regional trade, so they're not quite as intimately tied in the supply chain and uh, in the old saying that when uh, the U.S. coughs, uh, they get pneumonia. But uh, they're struggling and they're trying to figure out what to do. They're easing uh, conditions and fiscal and especially monetary policy. The second point to note is our unemployment rate, while it's come down a bit, uh, part of that has been that people have left the labor force. It's still quite high. I certainly agree with Laura that there's a large jobs gap in employment and underemployment and a huge skills mismatch. How much of this is cyclical and how much of that is skills mismatch, we'll hear more about, I suppose, from Jim Heckman at lunch, who's one of the world's experts on that subject. I think it's some of each, but I'll leave it to him to go into more detail. Important to note that in Europe, unemployment is over 10 percent, in the Eurozone, 10.7 percent and rising. And here is the most frightening statistic of all. In some of those countries, the unemployment rate among people under 25 is almost 50 percent. In many others of them, it's over a quarter, and others over a third. That's the, that's the level of the overall, the quarter was the level of the overall unemployment rate at the depths of the Great Depression. So these are tremendously cataclysmic events. I, we, we, talk, we as economists talk about the numbers, but there's a lot of personal disruption, social unrest, tremendous battles going on. I believe the core of the problems are fiscal, and I'm going to try to explain that both analytically and with a little bit of data, and then come back to the United States. So if we look at deficits as a share of GDP, the U.S. is uh, tragically uh, running very large deficits as the expansion continues. Certainly some of this is still that the economy is uh, growing slowly, and some of it was additional tax cuts and additional, especially additional spending piled on originally, allegedly, to help uh, cushion the downturn and speed recovery, and now more and more of it's being asked to be re-upped and redone uh, in an attempt to try to goose the economy in the short term, in my regard for very little long-term consequences or even medium-term consequences that I'll get to in a moment. If you look at the share of debt, uh, many studies, Reinhardt and Rogoff's famous book, for example, tend to show that when the gross debt gets uh, over 90 percent, countries get in trouble. There's a lot of issues how much of that is caused and how much is an effect, and 60 to 90 percent may be the, uh, uh, the warning sign. The U.S. was in the 40s prior to the, uh, to the recession. Now, clearly, a sizable fraction of this, and by the way, about three and a half percentage points of the 15 percent tax rate, uh, tax share of GDP that uh, Laura mentioned earlier, is due to the cyclical performance of the economy back when the economy gets back to full employment. The current tax rates, not the ones that are, you know, if, if they expire, the current tax rates would yield about 18 and a half percent, slightly above our average. But in any event, here we are, and the U.S. is in perilous territory. Now, is the U.S. going to be, uh, follow the same route? How much is cause and how much is an effect? Well, let's talk for a moment about what's known about debt and why debt uh, may be an issue. Uh, why do countries slow when their debt gets high? Well, first of all, it tends to lead to a lot of uncertainty and instability about how that will be resolved, not just by bo sovereign bondholders, but by the populace. Will taxes be raised, for example? It's a, perhaps a leading indicator that taxes are going to be raised, as we've seen in Europe. So that tends to lead to capital flight and a variety of other things. Some of those are less of a concern in the U.S. than other countries, but high debt ratios are, are very damning. Secondly, we know that much, much higher tax, uh, tax burdens than the U.S. has. Notice I said much. I'm not arguing about one percentage point or something of GDP, but a much higher tax burden has been associated with much, with much slower growth. The advanced economies of Western Europe have standards of living about 30 to 35 percent below the United States. And while opinions differ on uh, how much of that difference is due to taxes, how much to their generous social insurance programs and unemployment, a broad definition of unemployment payments that are long term, uh, and so on, uh, I think of those as all of a piece. The taxes, after all, finance the spending. The spending, these transfer programs have disincentives to work built into them and so on. So I think a sizable fraction, Ed Prescott thinks it's all, I think that's an exaggeration, but a sizable fraction uh, 
So there is some limit beyond which uh, we get into a lot of trouble. We can argue whether we're quite there yet or not. The next point to make is a very, uh, a very simple one. And that is, what determines taxes and what determines the evolution of the debt? Uh, I'm going to try to translate differential equations and mathematical formulas into English real simply. Okay. <coughs> so first of all, the debt evolves according to two things. The primary budget position, which is the budget net of interest payments. So if you're running a primary surplus, generally the, the, the deficit will be coming down. If you're, you're running a primary balance, you'd be stabilizing the debt GDP ratio more or less. Uh, Laura mentioned something about that a moment ago. And if you're running a primary deficit, the debt will keep growing. The rate it grows reflects the difference between the rate of interest you pay on the debt and the growth rate of the economy. So not surprisingly, these economies in Europe with high deficits, high debt, are now paying high, much higher interest than their growth rate, and their debt is growing rapidly, and they're under this, in this kind of vicious circle of trying to get the debt under control, convince, convince people that they'll get it under control, at least in the medium term. The Greeks are supposed to get down to 120% by 2020. Uh, let's hope that happens uh, short of, an, uh, of a revolution in Greece, a country that has been in default 50% of the years in the last century. Well, so that's number one. You've got to get the budget in position to be stable. Now, it's certainly true that if the CBO projections proved out and these big tax increases that are due to occur didn't affect the economy very much, which I think would be a, a stretch, that we'd get the deficit at the end of the decade down to levels that were uh, consistent with the debt GDP ratio stabilizing, but at much higher levels than prior to the crisis and at levels well into this danger zone uh, in the gross debt beyond it, but in the net debt, well into a danger zone and rapidly approaching uh, serious problems. So uh, that's better than not doing that. It would be a good first step. But I want, want to illustrate one other thing as the political process, not just the current president, but previous presidents and previous congresses has been lax in dealing with these problems. We're losing shock absorbers. What happens if out there in 2018 we have another crisis, maybe over sovereign debt, maybe over U.S. debt, maybe over inflation because the Fed was doing, causing some problems, and then we wind up in a very difficult economy like the late 70s and early 80s? Those are all possibilities, and our options would be greatly limited by having the debt so elevated, uh, although it would be better to be stable than to keep rising. So these are very, very big problems. The second point I want to make is what determines the level of spending and taxes in the society? In the modern social welfare state, which the United States is, is one, uh, it's not as, quote, advanced, unquote, as the countries in Western Europe, but it's rapidly approaching there. We accelerated that uh, in the last administration and it greatly accelerated in this administration. But we still have a sizable way to go if we want to get there. The tax rate, so most of the spending now and especially in the future is going to be paying transfer payments to people. And what does the tax rate depend upon? Two factors. The product, I don't want to challenge your math, the product of two factors. The replacement rate, how generous the benefits are relative to the tax base, say wages or income. And the dependency ratio, how many people are getting the benefits relative to how many people are working and paying taxes. And there's a startling statistic made much worse by the deep recession and uh, somewhat by the response to it. There's a trend that had been going on beforehand. In 2009, 49% of Americans paid income taxes, and 47% received a benefit from the government. 60% lived in a household that received a benefit from the government. Now, some of that was certainly justifiable on humanitarian grounds. There was a very deep recession. There was a lot of unemployment. There was a lot of misery out there. So I'm not, I don't want to critique it. I'm just saying a long-run factor. So think about what happens as we've gone from a society in the 50s and 60s, and even in the 70s and 80s, with many, many more workers relative to recipients than we have now and we're projected to have in the future, 
And think of what that happens not only to, this, to the budget, but think of what happens to the political economy of the budget, to people wanting to vote to preserve or expand their benefits relative to paying taxes and what's likely to happen. So those are, those are just simple facts. I wrote a book in 1986 entitled Too Many Promises. Uh, unfortunately for me, I wrote it three years after the Greenspan Commission, Social Security Commission's good reforms, and it was thought to be somewhat alarmist. It turned out to be not nearly alarmist enough, but if I had waited 20 years, I would have been considered a seer. So it's kind of funny, but <laughs> this is not something we haven't known about for decades. We've had a titanic fiscal iceberg waiting for us, and we've sped up, not just in this administration, but we've sped up our way toward it. And it's, a, it's, a, it's really a tragedy, and it's going to be a big problem getting out of it. I cautiously optimistic we can. Now, on to uh, one other analytical point, and then the U.S. fiscal situation. The analytical point where I somewhat differ from Laura is if you divide the world into the short, medium, and long run, which I think is a very useful way to think about it, they are intimately interrelated. For example, the budget deficits we're running today imply we have to pay taxes to pay the interest payments in the future. Some people will anticipate those and it will affect their behavior today. Future tax rates affect business investment decisions today. Not every business investment decision is uh, uh, you know, a short-term decision. Some have lead times of three, five, seven, ten years before they start paying out, and then they'll pay out for a long time. People want to know what those tax rates are and have some certainty over it. As we learned from Frank Omoliani at MIT and Milton Friedman at Chicago many years ago, much of consumption is based on longer-term prospects, not just your current disposable income, although the fraction, that's a very small fraction, although it's a bit higher in a deep recession. So this notion we can kind of magically deal with these problems, be very successful in pushing stimulative fiscal policies, and have almost no long-run cost, I think, is exactly backwards. I think they are likely to have very small short-run impact and did, did indeed, maybe even negative, but probably a small positive, and at immense long-run cost. So I want to talk about that for a moment or two, but it's very important we get this point across, that the long run and the short run are intimately interrelated. I think virtually all economists would agree that it would be a very good thing to have a strong long-term deficit reduction package, overwhelmingly, maybe Laura's would be higher than mine, overwhelmingly on the spending side because all the successful fiscal consolidations in the OECD since World War II have had about $6 of spending cuts for every dollar of tax increases. The ones that were tax heavy were more likely to cause recessions. The one that cut, spend, cut spending did not. Uh, so just as a factual basis, leaving ideology aside. And remember, we're talking about slowing the projected growth of those benefits that Laura was showing you. These aren't benefits that, uh, that, these aren't cuts from current levels. These are slowing the rate of growth. In Social Security, 55% of the increase in, in projected spending is increased spending, real spending, adjusted for inflation per beneficiary in minorities due to demography. In healthcare, in Medicare, it's 80 and 20. So all we have to do is slow the projected growth of that. That's what's being called cutting spending. It ought to be done primarily on the spending side. I'm not totally allergic to taxes. I don't want to be asked to pay more taxes than we're in the process of heading toward unless we get a lot more bang for the buck out of the spending and it's worthwhile to pay more taxes. And I'll say one last word about that in a moment. Let's come back to the U.S. So this is the um, projection the administration made when it took office. And this is what's actually happened in the traditional headline unemployment rate. If we include the uh, underemployment and discouraged workers that Laura properly mentioned, uh, we'd have another graph, and the number would be about 55 billion work hours light rather than 27.5 billion work hours light. Now, there's two reasons for this. One, of course, the recession was worse than they assumed. But the second is I think they were wildly optimistic about the efficacy of the policies, and I want to just mention a couple of things about that. The same CBO does studies of, uh, uh, looks at the range of studies about the efficacy of the fiscal stimulus, and they range from about 0.7 million jobs to a little over 3 million jobs. So we're talking, uh, so we're talking about 
$300,000 to $1.1 million per job in a world where the median pay is $38,000. Let's look at the individual programs, many of which were poorly designed, poorly implemented. So we had, for example, cash for clunkers. Move sales forward a few months, then they collapsed. What happened? We paid 20 times the European Union carbon trading price per ton of emissions reduced. It was lousy environmental policy as well. The public-private investment partnership was supposed to take $1 to $2 trillion of toxic assets off the books of the banks, wound up at 3% of its original, subscribed, uh, original goal, even though there were non-recourse loans. We have serious problems with job training. Laura properly pointed to, and I, I strongly endorse what she said about job training. It's a, we've got to improve it. The president said he was going to go through the budget line by line. I don't mean to get personal. But he didn't notice there are four dozen federal job training programs. So he added another one for green jobs. 50,000 people went through it. 3% of them got jobs. You go on and on. Green energy. We have serious national security and potentially serious environmental reasons to be diversifying our energy source by geography and by type, including a lot more North American oil and gas in the medium, short and medium term, and a lot more emphasis on the research side of, of, of uh, alternatives and renewables rather than this industrial policy of going out and trying to subsidize firms left and right that uh, have no business uh, having the federal government being a venture capitalist. But what happened, with, say, with $4.3 on wind farms? We created 300 jobs, $15 million a job. Now, those are extremes, but I'm just trying to tell you that the notion that this was effective, I think, is really, really uh, inad inaccurate. And there's a big cost. We've got to pay interest in the future to pay for it. Harold Ulig estimates there's almost $3 of present value of future costs for every dollar of short-term stimulus spending. Even at half that, we have to question whether it was a good idea. So all I'm raising is the subject of this general discussion that it worked, it prevented something. I think the monetary policy and the original QE was sensible. I think, unfortunately, QE2 and Operation Twist were not and uh, invaded the Treasury's prerogatives about fiscal policy and the um, uh, maturity structure of the debt. Now, is it, is it always impossible to design fiscal policy that may work when the Fed's kind of out of ammunition? Now, Keynesian economics teaches us that at um, large multipliers, Federal government spends a dollar, and we get more than a dollar of output. The Obama administration assumed 1.5. Most it's based on sticky prices and wages, and much consumption out of current income. Consumption was not out of current income. It's, it hardly budged when uh, disposable income went up. And prices in general are not sticky. Uh, Witness Pete Kleinau's work at Stanford. So. What can we conclude from this? Well, there is one time that might be a decent model, and that's when the Fed is at the zero lower bound of interest rates and there's a sticky price, short-term interest rates can't go lower. Now, the rest of us are paying rates above that, and uh, we're, you know, real rates are negative, but and if there's something to that case, and there are many analytical studies and a couple of others that suggest that you could get multipliers of two or more at the zero lower bound. But those same studies suggest that if people are expecting big taxes and spending beyond the zero lower bound, the multipliers could actually be negative, a destroyer, not a multiplier. And of course, President Obama not only had the big deficits, but he had the substantial additional spending in other areas, in health care and energy and a variety of other places uh, outside just the direct stimulus spending. Uh, another study, a, a Berkeley study of a colleague of Laura's, Alan Auerbach and Yuri Grunchenko, say that the multipliers historically in the U.S. have been about a little over two in recessions, but are negative in expansions when unfortunately almost all the spending occurred. So I just, you know, I think we don't really know for sure. It's, we don't have perfect natural experiments, but there's a lot of reasons to be dubious about the ability to stimulate the economy short term. Last point, infrastructure. I agree with Laura. There are a lot of infrastructure needs in the United States. Some of them are even federal. But short-term stimulus is an atrocious way to do infrastructure. Good planning takes years, according to Harvard's Ed Glazer. The spending that was done was not done in the areas with the highest unemployment or the biggest housing bus. There are only two problems with shovel-ready, shovels and ready. 
They weren't ready in modern infrastructure projects, don't use shovels. Okay? So I'm for all of this pre-competitive generic research the president wants to fund that passes serious peer review. And I'm for a strong federal infrastructure program that passes a rigorous cost-benefit test, not highly politicized. But there's a lot of slip between uh, the drawing this up in a textbook and how it gets implemented in the political process. And I think a lot of people would like to see a lot bigger bang for the buck before we start paying more into the system where uh, we're getting such little bang for the buck. So let me just conclude then with this last point. We have lots of opportunities, lots of challenges before us. I think the way forward on most of them is very clear. I think we have to get the long-term deficit under control, and if we did that and we made big progress in that and got the corporate income tax rate down, that would help the economy now, tomorrow. And that's number one as part of a general tax reform. Uh, I would agree that there is some risk of a rapid fiscal consolidation, especially with all countries doing it simultaneously. Interest rates are already low. The U.S. is a fifth of the global economy. Uh, the countries where it's obviously worked in the past were small and more open. Interest rates were higher. So I think that in the end, uh, the proper thing to do is to have a rigorous medium-term fiscal consolidation as the economy recovers over the next few years, combined with a very strong uh, long-term deficit, uh, uh, deficit and debt control measure that brings uh, the growth of spending down and does it primarily on the spending side. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, actually, it's my question. Okay. Um, thank you both. That's great. Um, I have a question. Actually, you segued into it. <laughs> Laura wanted to comment on it, so my question uh, goes from your ending into both of you discussing. We find ourselves in the happy circumstance where U.S. citizens and foreign entities are lending to us at zero interest rates. So we're living beyond our means, but what the hell? Everybody <laughs> seems to be happy to do that for us at zero interest rates. Um, right. That probably isn't going to go on forever. Um, so what I'm curious is each of you, like Laura will go first because she wanted to comment on it. What does that, how ugly is that scenario and how rapidly does that uh, develop when U.S aging or not aging population will want to return for their investment, as do uh, the developing countries? Well, I don't think anyone knows exactly how rapidly uh, the, 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 the bond market would turn against the United States. I, I think for a very long time, for the la really for the entire Obama administration, there have been, uh, there's been agreement among economists, I think Michael was a signatory to this, and lots and lots of letters have gone in to say the right thing to do, and that is exactly how Michael ended his comment, is to put together now a serious, credible, multi-year deficit reduction plan uh, to uh, perhaps, some people have suggested, triggering the uh, the beginning of the plan to some measure of the economy being closer to uh, full employment, meaning closer to just the unemployment rate that is a mismatch or a structural or a fric frictional problem, not a cyclical problem. So if you take my estimate, the current unemployment rate is 8.3. The structural frictional, we can hear Jim's estimate of this at lunch, somewhere between 5 and 6. We, we still have more than a couple of percentage points of unemployment that is simply due to the anemic pace of the recovery and to still levels of demand, which have not fully been uh, restored. But we could certainly put together a deficit reduction plan now that could exist over many years that would actually say to the bond market and say to the citizens and deal with the expectations problems Michael is talking about, yeah, we know we have a problem. Right now, actually, uh, the issue is uh, continuing to support the system with uh, some relief. That would be the argument for the payroll tax extension that just went through this year. Uh, that adds to the short-term immediate deficit, but we understand that we can do that now because we have a very attractive borrowing rate, and everybody believes we're going to be responsible in the long term. So that, that's, the, that's really what we should be uh, aiming for. Then I think you can get to the level of the debate about, all right, what 
debt to GDP ratio should we be aiming for or what size government we should be aiming for or what deficit to GDP ratio should we be aiming for. I, pers I use three as deficit to GDP as the first goal because that stabilizes giving the underlying growth rate of the U.S. economy that stabilizes the debt to GDP ratio. So the first thing you do is stabilize it. Then there's a kind of a consensus among economists sort of based on a lot of different models that you get, once you stabilize it, your target is something like 60% of GDP as debt to GDP. That's a sustainable level given interest rates and long-term uh, growth rates in the U.S. economy. So, and then you talk about how you want to do that. How big do you want the, the government spending cuts to be? How big do you want the revenue contributions to be? And then you get into the kinds of debates that Michael was suggesting that, that he and I might have because I might put a little more on the revenue side and a little less on the spending side. And because I really, I really do want to emphasize, because it does drive me a little, um, a little to distraction, I, I think it's important to really focus on not a sort of generalized entitlement problem because one of my charts shows very clearly that this is not a social security getting out of hand problem. You can make some adjustments there, but that's not it. The issue is health, and the issue is health not just because of the aging of the population, not, not. It's because of the overall growth of healthcare spending in the entire economy. And so I would say if you want to talk about how to do this after you decide what you want to do, what deficit GDP, what focus on health. <laughs> and to your earlier point when you were up there, that not once you decide the size of the government, then you want to decide where it actually spends its money. Right, right. right. Where it spends its money. Right. Let me make a couple of quick comments because I agree with virtually everything Laura just said other than how high the taxes should go. Um, <laughs> right. <that's and laughs> for, for just a point of clarification, uh, it is clear that the projected growth of health care sp spending is the dominant feature here. But the unfunded li projected unfunded liabilities in Social Security is lar are as large as the regular national debts. They're not trivial. And we are in a situation now where the current taxes, with no increase in the tax rate, would fund the entire Social Security program if we did one thing. We switched from wage to price indexing, so we kept mm -hmm. real benefits constant. Mm -hmm. Nobody's benefits would be cut. Nobody's taxes would go up projected benefits wouldn't rise as much as they are today. Now, the replacement rate for how much you got later on in life wouldn't grow, wouldn't stay as high and wouldn't grow, but it would get much closer to, it would be sustainable. I personally would raise benefits some at the bottom for, for poor elderly. I'd also like to see a personal accounts component added, but I think those are much less important than doing something, the bulk of which was this, and if we combined it with going to what uh, you've heard this from Alan Simpson when he spoke here, the change CPI, which is something that grew out of right. uh, my work on the Boston Commission that uh, should be used for indexing all programs in which all these, all these uh, fandangos in Washington over the last few years, including those between the president and Speaker Boehner and between the gang of six of Blair House and all this stuff, they all finally gave in and said that they would do the change CPI because the Republicans had to agree that it would raise revenue a little bit. <laughs> Democrats said it would cut benefits a little bit benefits. from projected levels. So they're all uh, having a hard time with that. If we did those two things, it would, you wouldn't even have to have full wage indexing, but you'd easily solve all these problems. And uh, so that is straightforward, but because it's straightforward doesn't mean we shouldn't do it and, and spend years doing health care and wait and just have Social Security get out of control from us. Mm -hmm. On the health care side, I think that there are some very uh, promising measures because a lot of this is the interaction between the public and private systems. And I think that the premium support models from uh, Paul Ryan and Alice Rivlin and Senator uh, Wyden and uh, Congressman Wyden, whether you agree with their exact formulation and how, how much support they have and how rapidly that declines as you go up the income scale, uh, I think is the right way to go. And by, by the way, generically, we ought to be spending much more of our time, for those of you concerned about uh, how well the well-off are doing, we ought to be spending our time reducing the subsidies and transfer payments to the well-off, not in trying to raise their taxes. We want our most productive and successful citizens working and uh, investing, not chasing government largesse. Okay. Um, questions from the audience? 
Yes, back here in the. Um, Professor Boskin, you said that every successful deficit reduction has had six dollars in spending cuts to one dollar in revenue increases. And I was wondering if you could elaborate on that, and then we could get Professor Tyson to respond. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I didn't quite say that. What I said that I think I said, or I should have said, if I didn't say this, if I was speaking too rapidly, which I'm prone to do, I apologize. You know, we're used to 50-minute lectures, so it's hard to this is give 15 very, yes. or 20 minutes. <laughs> so yes. uh, a, a sweeping study of all the, all the fiscal consolidations in all the OECD countries since World War II concluded that the average successful consolidation Average around six dollars in spending cuts for every dollar of tax increases. Some had more taxes, some had no taxes, etc. Uh, so it's an average of those. Successful in two senses: it consolidated the budget, got the budget on a more sustainable path, and didn't cause a recession. So, so that you know, could we get away with something different, more or less, probably? But you know, you should take some notion that. Uh, the notion that it can't happen here is a very dangerous notion. Uh, these other societies have dealt with it, and for lots of reasons, that seems to be sort of the ballpark. But, but you, you would say, though, on that, I, I would just say that uh, th there is no theoretical or analytical model that suggests that number. And remember, those societies have much, much larger shares of government spending and taxes and GDP than the U.S. does. I mean, I actually think for the U.S., I, I would put it a little differently, and it, it really goes to the issue of what Michael's saying in terms of uh, entitlements, health and Social Security. So if, if, you, if you actually look at the, the numbers, uh, under President Reagan, federal tax receipts as a share of GDP, 18%. Federal government spending as a share of GDP, 22%. Clinton, uh, federal taxes as a share of GDP, 19%. Federal government spending as a share of GDP, 19%. If you look at the average, 1960 to 2009, average, federal tax receipts of GDP, 18%, and federal government spending of GDP at 20%. So we don't have, we, we've not done over the, over, uh, the 1960 to 2009 period, we haven't really run a, a balanced budget position. On the other hand, relative to every other country in that OECD study, our federal government is small and our federal tax rate is small. Now, all I say is we need to think about whether we have made, since President Reagan, many, many commitments to our society to uh, provide things, including to provide health care whose cost has been absolutely uh, much higher than expected. Do we think we want to say, okay, well, we don't want to do that anymore, so we want to bring down the current spending <coughs> share of GDP to 20, the, which would be the Clinton level, to 22, which would be the Reagan level, to something even lower, which would be the tax take revenue at 18% after we recover, that's, that's a really significant question, which I don't think, given the size of the problem we're dealing with, I don't think to restore revenues to the, to, as a share of GDP to a 20% range, to go back to the kind of Clinton burden of taxes that we had, is going to have anywhere near the negative effect that Michael seems to suggest. We've lived with a significantly higher share of revenues as a share of GDP. We've lived with higher tax rates. If the Bush tax cuts were allowed to expire, simply that, the, you, the deficit numbers look so different. For people who are really concerned about deficit and debt, I'll tell you, look at the CBO numbers. The deficit to GDP ratio falls below 3%. We don't have a medium-term deficit problem anymore if we decide as a society to do that. So I just want to size the problem here and also say that the OECD studies are not very helpful in this regard because these are societies which already have much higher shares of both taxes and spending in the GDP ratio. And then let me just on, on um, premium support because I think this really is important. You know, I was on the 1998 Commission for Premium Support, and there were a couple of us economists on there who really uh, were intrigued by the idea of premium support. This is where you, you, you give people on Medicare, instead of giving them the right to a sort of set of benefits at 
by any willing provider. You give them uh, some money to basically go and decide what insurance to buy. And the idea is competition will bring down the price. The problem with that is that there's no evidence of that to be true. There's just, there just isn't any. If you look at the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan or you look at other things like this that, that private uh, sector uh, big companies run, it doesn't bring down the rate of growth of health care insurance cost. It doesn't. So finally, the, provider ha the, the insurer has to say, I'm just not going to give you that much premium support anymore. I'm gonna. So it's the competition isn't what brings the cost down. It's capping, capping the amount you pay the beneficiary. And I, I just think we should get at the notion that a lot of this premium support stuff, which says, oh, we'll get all these wonderful competitive effect on, on costs, there's virtually no evidence that that's the case. So what we'll get is a set of capping the payments to Medicare beneficiaries. We can decide we want to do that, but that's what ultimately will control the cost. As a, as a son of a German colonel, I'm aware of an maximum that rank has its privilege. Yep, take it. And Secretary Schultz has his hand up. But first, Michael wants a 30-second yeah. rebuttal. Okay. 30-second yeah, rebuttal, and then we go to Secretary a, Schultz. A, a fine-tuning of some uh, statements Laura made. Uh, I agree with much of what she said. I think the idea uh, in premium support is you'd wind up with higher co-pays and you get some price competition. Gary Becker has some intriguing work about that being very successful when you get co-pays up in the 30% range. Two other real quick points. We are certainly have a smaller share of taxes and spending in GDP. I think that's one reason we've had a much more successful economy. Um, but you can't just compare central and central because we're a much more decentralized federal system than most places other than China, by the way, intriguingly. Um, so when you add it all up, you know, we're now, our spending is in the high 30s, and uh, that's getting close to the 45 to 50 that many European countries are from the low 30s where we used to be. We've kind of moved 40% of the way there. Uh, the last thing I would say is I totally agree that none of these big picture issues are dispositive about minor changes in the taxes and tax rates. They're about large changes, but large changes, you can keep making a series of small changes that become a large change, so you ought to be able to justify it and do it in conjunction with, a, with spending control that will prevent future large changes. Secretary Schultz. Larry Summers, a leading economist, served in the Obama administration yeah. and in the Clinton administration. In a Financial Times article about two weeks or so ago, yeah. called for, in effect, stabilizing the personal income tax system through a redo of the 1986 Tax Act, in effect with, I assume, similar kind of scoring on where the marginal rate would land. I note that was originally proposed by President Reagan. It was introduced in both the House and Senate by Democrats, passed the Senate 97 to 3. What do you think of Larry's proposal? Well, Larry's proposal is not unique. A lot of us have been calling for this for a long time. It not only would be good tax reform and good for the long-term health of the economy, it could actually help the economy now. For example, the prospect of lower corporate rates, I think, would be very beneficial to investment now. Uh, and the prospect of a more stable certain tax code, even though that might slowly unravel, mm -hmm. as the 86 tax reform did, I think would be very good now. It's important, though, what the details are. So if we have what's, to get the technical jargon, statically scored as revenue neutral, it means you broaden the base, so you double the base and have the rates. So you bring the rates down 10% and broaden the base of uh, 10%. Uh, and that scores is zero. The lower rates and the broader base are likely to generate a little bit more than that because it will help the economy, and that could be used be a kind of a dividend for deficit reduction. Uh, but let me just then say it's also important what the, what the tax reform looks like. And um, you can't just look at the rate and rates and the headlines. You have to look at the tax base. It's very important we move the tax code more toward a consumption base and less toward an income base. And I think that is, uh, that is going to be where the big battle is. I think there are very good long-run growth effects, very good administrative reasons, but I think it moving toward something that either directly or, or de facto integrates the corporate and personal tax on a broad base with lower rates of, uh, that eventually tax consume income would be a huge improvement. Uh, so first of all, I want to say today, I, I, on the issue of the corporate tax, uh, today I have a, 
piece in the New York Times blog, Economics, I absolutely agree with Michael on the need to bring the corporate rate down, broaden the base, create greater certainty. I didn't find, I read Larry's article more than once and was a little confused by that. He didn't have a lot of details there. He really didn't. Um, if you think about what, say, Simpson Bowles has said or what uh, Domenici Rivlin has said, a lot of the big uh, deficit reduction proposals out there do say that we should uh, cut the marginal tax rates. I'm not convinced, by the way, but this is what they say, that cut them. Uh, put more income, maybe all income, capital gains, dividends, all income. This would violate what Michael's talking about in terms of savings and, and consumption. Put all income into the uh, tax base, so you get a lower rate, but you're taxing everything. You're not basically making distortions between one form of income and another form of income. The other thing they all say is uh, some variety of capping the tax expenditures for individuals. And just remember, these are extremely large. Tax expenditures, the, the amount spent on tax expenditures in the United States for individuals is the same. It's more than what we spend right now on defense. It's more than what we spend on Medicare. It's about what we spend on Social Security. So that's basically, that's the mortgage interest deduction, the charity deduction, the state and local deduction, the employer deduction so that you can get health care as a, as a tax subsidy, subsidized activity through your employer. There, these are very, very large sources of eroding the revenue base. And all of that's happened since 1987. So really a tax reform would, the, the details matter here because in order to generate real revenues from this kind of reform, you, are, you have to go after very, very large entitlements. And by entitlements, I mean the right to have a deduction for your charitable contribution, the right to have a deduction for your mortgage interest, the right to have a deduction because you live in California and you have to pay all those dreadful California state taxes. Um, I finally will to say that uh, I finally will say that you know <laughs> basically uh, econ so economists I think in general these forms the the proposals do suggest bringing the marginal rates down, capping or eliminating the tax expenditures. So you get a broader base, a lower rate, and then the, you get to the debate about, well, what should be in the income base? Should it include dividends and, and capital gains? Those are some of the big issues. Last, let me just gentleman. make one real quick comment about that. Um, on this issue of uh, tax expenditures and what's being cut and so on, it's important to note that um, what base you're looking at and what you're doing on the spending side are part of the picture. You can't just do this in isolation. So some people look at, Republicans in particular, like to look at what the current situation would do at full employment, about 18.5%. Mm -hmm. Democrats like to think about it with all the dreaded Bush tax cuts gone, and that's a higher number. Right. And, that's the baseline. And, and also, Simpson, Bowles, and most of these other people have hard caps on the spending share of GDP, which, which, is, which is a way of uh, suppressing additional tax hikes. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. think that you can't think of these totally independently. There's a gentleman back there um, who's had his hand up since the beginning. You, you no longer have a question? Yeah, you with the beard. Okay. I, I, while, he, while he's getting the microphone, I'd like to go on record as saying that I'm opposed to, I'm in favor of eliminating all tax deductions except the ones I use. So. Right. I think, that, I think you get unanimous support here <laughs> for that. <laughs> uh, so for both of you, uh, you both mentioned that health care spending is a significant uh, problem going forward. You both kind of briefly mentioned your ideal solutions, but I was just wondering if you could elaborate on, on your approaches to uh, containing health care spending. Well, I was actually uh, not, I was trying to indicate that I don't know, sadly, and I don't think anyone knows. The difference, the fundamental difference between Social Security and Medicare health care costs in the budget is we do know exactly what Michael said and a few other things. There's a long list of things, some of which uh, Michael handed over to the Clinton administration. They've been handed on from year to year that are relatively simple to do that solve the Social Security problem in the short term, in the medium term, and in the long term. And they're politically difficult maybe, but they are just, it's very clear what to do. We, we don't know what to do. 
to control the rate of growth of health care costs. And the reason I want to say that is look at, the, look at Medicare over its history and look at the private insurance system. The private insurance system in general has been outperformed by Medicare. <coughs> Despite the fact that Medicare has an elderly population, a sicker population, a population which uses care, therefore, more intensively, Medicare actually, per person, has done a slightly better job than the private system with all of its competition. We have more competition in the healthcare system than any other advanced industrial country. We have lots of competition. And we have, and competition itself has not generated the kinds of uh, cost savings, productivity improvements that we would anticipate. The, the U.S. healthcare system does not generate better outcomes. It generates more costly outcomes, not better outcomes. Now, you can say, well, yeah, there's high-end stuff that nobody else can do. Yeah, okay, so we can do high-end stuff. Uh, I'm talking about the cost of the overall system and its rate of growth over time. Um, People who've looked at this, I mean, and that's what I, I mentioned the letter that a number that I signed that a number of healthcare experts signed, basically saying, you know, we don't, when, when they put together the healthcare reform legislation, forever, whatever you think about it, the underlying uh, healthcare experts working on it were trying to suggest, well, accountable care is one thing that you need to worry about. Another thing you need to worry about, uh, the main thing, thing that apparently is a, is a cost saver if you can get providers to do it is effective case management. Another thing is if you can get hospitals and doctors to do it, penalizing them if people uh, show up at the hospital two weeks later uh, when, in fact, if the procedures had been correct, they would not do that. Those are the kinds of nitty-gritty cost containment measures that have been incorporated into this healthcare legislation that build on what we've seen has been working either experimentally in Medicare or by some provider groups in some parts of the country. It is really hard to do and no one knows uh, the answer. Let me, uh, let me make four quick points. One, a startling fact that will reinforce the growth of healthcare cost problem. Uh, currently, we spend about $1.06 in GDP on healthcare in the United States publicly and privately all in. It's projected to go to one in three. Mm -hmm. That means over that period, over the next several decades, we, we're projected to spend half the growth <laughs> of our income on health care. Mm -hmm. So the first question you naturally ask is, will it be worth it? What will we get for it? <laughs> the problem is, that's a very hard question to answer for a variety of reasons. Amongst other things, that much of health care is purchased at zero marginal cost at the point of demand and delivery through third-party insurance, tax subsidies, et cetera, Medicare, et cetera. So we really don't know how people are valuing the stuff. I'm not talking about life-saving, catastrophic stuff, but just the routine stuff that a lot of people do. Um, when we buy CEPR tickets, when we buy fresh orange juice, uh, we've revealed that the value to us is at least as large as the cost. But that, you know, so we've, we're, we're revealing that the value to the people doing it, for whatever reason, they like to kibitz with the doctor or whatever it happens, I don't mean to make light of it, some of it's important, is at least zero. So we know it's costly to deliver it. Uh, so <laughs> that's a big issue. Uh, in trying to separate out even what's inflation versus what's, what's actually the product that's being delivered, mm -hmm. when you have rapid technological change and quality improvement, there are several areas in cataracts and heart surgeries, et cetera, where economists have done very important work showing that a large part of it is radically improved outcomes, and it's being measured as inflation in our price indices. So we're just at the way of getting through that. But getting to how you deal with the costs, there are only two options. You ration or you ration by price. Or you ration. <laughs> That's right. You ration and or you ration. I think the latter is a much better solution for the bulk of non-emergency, non-catastrophic expenditures. I think we ought, to, we ought to try that. But I think Laura is perfectly correct. We can't be sure how it will work, whether it will be nearly enough. Maybe we'll have to spend more on it. We'll have to see. But until we do, with, do that, we're not going to know. Um, speaking of rationing, I feel terrible at this because there are at least five or six people who have had their hand up for 15 minutes, um, but we're out of time. 
And so if you've got, sorry, if you've got questions, maybe you can, that probably be exiting this way, maybe you can block them from leaving. Well, I, we're going to be around part of the day. Yeah. Too, right. So so, um, so this has yeah. been, I mean, obviously we didn't allocate enough time for this topic because we could go on for another hour. That's, we need, that's right. And thank, right. So <laughs> thank you, uh, Michael. Thank, thank you, Laura. Thank you. Yeah.